Hello and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the show, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. We all know that our relationships are some of the most important parts of our lives, and our happiness and fulfillment are often directly correlated to the strength of those relationships. But as we get a little older, and I'm definitely experiencing that these days, building and maintaining meaningful relationships often gets harder and harder for people. And these relationships, while incredibly important for everyone, are particularly valuable for those who are not well-supported by broader social systems. So today we're going to be exploring how we can build stronger relationships, be connected and even vulnerable with others while still holding healthy boundaries, and the key skills that help us get there. To help us do that, I'm joined today by Dr. Joy Harden Bradford. Dr. Joy is a licensed psychologist based out of Atlanta, Georgia, the host of the wildly popular podcast Therapy for Black Girls, which has more than 34 million downloads, and the author of the recently released book, Sisterhood Heals, The Transformative Power of Healing and Community. Dr. Joy, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me, Forrest. I have been so looking forward to this. Uh, I love your work. I love the podcast. Really enjoyed the book. Uh, One of the things that really drew me to it initially is very early on in the book, you talk about your experience leading group therapy, I think dating back to like 2005 when you were at VCU. Is that right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, that was my introduction to group was as an intern. That's awesome. And so you've been doing that for a really, really long time. And over the 300 or so episodes of the podcast, we've talked about like most of the popular ways to do therapy out there at this point, but we've never really talked about groups. So I would love it if you could start just by explaining What's group therapy like and how does that connect to the work you're doing these days? Yeah, thank you so much for that. So I think it's really interesting um, because I feel like the fact that you haven't covered group is like indicative of where group often falls in the realm of options for therapy. Um, And so I'm glad that we're kind of getting group back on the map because I do think that it is probably, well, it is actually my favorite way to practice. I don't do it as much anymore, um, but it's actually my favorite way to practice just because I think that there are breakthroughs that you get through get to in group that take years, if not, you know, months, if not years to get to an individual Mm. therapy. Um, So there are lots of different kinds of groups, but the groups I am most familiar with and most often practice with um, are interpersonal process groups. And so those are the kinds of groups where there's not any particular topic that you're coming to talk about. It really is more about your experience as a human and what happens when we put you know, seven to eight different people in a room with all of their stories, all of their histories, and stuff just kind of starts bouncing off of one another. And the idea is really that, you know, wherever we go, there we are, so to speak. And so if you have trouble with assertiveness, or you're a people pleaser, or you tend to take up too much space in a room, the idea is that that will eventually present in group, and then you can get real-time feedback about how others are perceiving you and the different kinds of things you may need to work on. You said something just right at the beginning there, where there are opportunities for for growth, for breakthroughs of different kinds that can happen in a group environment at maybe an accelerated rate for certain kinds of issues for people if they're dealing with different kinds of things. And I was wondering why you feel that way. Like, what's the opportunity that's available in group? So, I mean, typically with individual therapy, it's just you and the therapist, right? So there's just a one person vantage point, whereas in group, you are likely, you know, looking at at least five different other people who are also getting information about you and I do feel like, you know, your peers in a group can kind of give you feedback in a way that's very different than a therapist would, because as therapists, we are, you know, trying to balance support and challenge. We're waiting waiting for the right time to maybe be able to say something difficult to you, but your peers don't have that obligation. And so sometimes they're, yeah, they can push you in ways that it may take a little longer to do in individual therapy. Yeah, I think that kind of like you were saying at the beginning, I I think that some clinicians, I'm not a clinician, but just in my experience, my my dad's a therapist, my partner's a therapist, most of my friends at this point are therapists just based on doing this work. People can get kind of spooked by group, even clinicians, because there's, you know, you're not the only person in there. You're not driving the whole bus. You can't like totally control the environment. There's this other element there that's like a little, a little unique. Yeah, it it definitely is. And I will say, you know, when I first started running groups, it was very overwhelming. Um, So, you know, thankfully, the experience we had at VCU was that you were 
um, what's called a process observer for a little while before you actually became a speaking member of the group. And what that meant is that you were just paying attention to what was going on, who was talking, who was responding in a certain way when other people talked. And so it really helped to kind of get a, a feel for what the dynamics are like. And there's a lot that's in a room when you are bringing people together, especially when you're just kind of sitting back and observing the process. And so it, it really can be difficult to kind of manage and pay attention to all the different things that people are saying and try to kind of, you know, keep the ship going on, um, you know, one course. Um, but I also find that fascinating and, and really like energizes me um, just because you don't ever know what's going to be brought into the room. And I do think that sometimes you get much more valuable information and can just learn about yourself in very different ways in a group process. Yeah, yeah, no, totally. And I'm just trying to kind of like transplant myself into a group therapy setting for a second and just kind of feel what that would be like for for a person. And a huge part of it, like of just the work of therapy in general, is massive vulnerability, right? You're stepping into a room with a person who hopefully you develop like a trusting relationship with. And you're you're really kind of, you know, turning yourself inside out in some ways in front of them. That's an incredibly vulnerable process. And it's hard enough to do when there's just one other person sitting in the room with you. But when there are eight other people sitting in the room with you, oh my God, like that is stressing me out just kind of thinking about it right now. So I'm wondering how you kind of manage that vulnerability aspect of it for people. Yeah, that's great insight for us. And you know, one of the things that I think makes group really powerful is that the vulnerability sometimes comes a little quicker because you realize that you are not the only person struggling with anything that you might be feeling. So I think that's one of the things that's actually the success that make, leads to the success of groups is that you hear people talk about things and even if the content is not the same, right? Like we may be talking about grief because I've lost a parent and maybe you lost a partner or something different, but we can all relate to the feelings of sadness, the feelings of disappointment, even if the content is different. Different. And so I think in group, when you hear other people share some things that you maybe felt ashamed about, or you think like, oh my gosh, I didn't know anybody else felt that way. It really opens up the space for vulnerability. And I think we, we I do want to back up a little bit because there's also some groundwork that happens in yeah, groups. Yeah, I was just about to ask you about that. Perfect. Right? Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Please go ahead. <laughs> You know, you definitely don't want to enter into this group of strangers and not know like what's going on. Are they going to keep my information safe? And yeah. so, of course, a part of what makes um, group a safe space is that you do have repeated conversations about what are the ground rules of our space. Um, and so often that means, of course, confidentiality. So um, even if you talk about the kinds of things that you're working on in your group therapy, it's not OK to share other people's information or to share their identity. Um, typically, we also ask that people not connect with one another outside of the group because that can then lead to tension inside of the group, right? So if you and another member get really close and you start, you know, like going to happy hours together and going to dinners together, that may lead to you like doing some of the work that you need to be doing in group actually outside at dinner, which then takes away from the group process. There's typically a conversation around like physical safety. So sometimes really strong um, emotions come up in group and it's OK to kind of verbalize that, but it's not OK to talk, to touch anybody either in anger or even just comforting. Um, and again, all of that adds to the safety. And so I think, you know, having those kinds of ground rules and like a framework for how the space is held also really help to, you know, make it a space that allows for that vulnerability. Are there things that you're doing as somebody who's who's leading a group or just like working with people in your in your work more broadly these days to to help lay that trust foundation that can get people to a place where they're comfortable coming forward with some of the more vulnerable material that might be like on the table for them? Mm hmm. So I think one one way that we often do this is by connecting people's stories. Um, and so as the mm. leader of a group, you likely would have done an intake with all of the members. And so you probably know some history um, that maybe they haven't even shared. And of course, you want to allow people to kind of share their stories on their own pace. But you could say like, hey, Forrest, 
um, you know, it sounds like what you're sharing sounds very similar to something that Robert has talked about in the past. I wonder if you have something else to offer here. So you're really trying to connect people because the root, the role of the therapist in group is really just more facilitation. It is not as kind of guided as it is sometimes in individual therapy. The work actually happens between the members. And so you're really wanting them to start relying on one another, to start connecting with one another. So one of the ways to do that is to kind of connect people's stories together. That's great. And I would love it if you could just connect the dots here a little bit between the work that you were doing um, and learning about even back at VCU in 2005 and the work that you're doing these days with people. Yeah. So, you know, like you mentioned, much of my work now is like the podcast and kind of, you know, managing and facilitating the community in therapy for Black girls. And in a lot of ways, I do feel like it mimics group. Um, So I kind of envision the conversations that we have on the podcast as like a continuous group conversation. So this week we may be talking about this thing and next week we're talking about something different. Um, But I do view it as like a continuing conversation. And so it doesn't feel separated in some ways. It feels like we are just kind of tapping into different kinds of things that people may be paying attention to Um, because I'm also really in tune with like what kinds of things people are watching and listening to and reading. I'm also kind of in tune, I feel like with what people may need to hear at any given time, right? So, you know, there's no shortage of crises that have been happening um, in the world in the past couple of years. And so sometimes, you know, we will kind of change up the programming. Maybe we were thinking about talking about one particular topic on the podcast this week, but because something happens, then we kind of shift focus and go to what we feel like our community needs. And so I also feel like that mimics what's happening in group, that even you go in with the idea like, okay, we're going to pick up where we left off last week or something like that. And then something happens and you have to be able to kind of change course. So the name of your recently released book is Sisterhood Heals. Uh, For starters, congratulations. I wrote a book with my dad, Rick, back about five, six years ago in 2017, I think it was. And man, writing a book is a ton of work. So, you know, congratulations on just like finishing that whole process and do credit (laughs) and all of that. And I'm really interested in this this notion of how, how trust and loyalty and that secure environment that you're creating in a formally in a group setting actually just shows up in our normal day-to-day friendships and relationships with people. And one of the things that tends to come up as a topic, and I'm saying this as a guy, I'm an outsider to this, but when I hear my female friends talk about their other female friendships, friendships with other women, words like trust and loyalty and respect come up a lot more often than I hear them come up in my relationships with other men most of the time. And I just think that that's really interesting. For example, you give a uh, a story from a member of your community in the book pretty early on about how their mom always cautioned them to be wary of their female friends because women just weren't trustworthy. And this feels like a major issue you got to navigate if you want to build strong female relationships with people. And so for starters, am I kind of reading that correctly as an outsider to it? And also, what do you think about that? Yeah, you are reading that correctly. And I think, you know, in conversations and interviews I did in preparation for the book, many people had a similar kind of story where they had had a conversation with their mom or their grandmother that kind of warned them about being wary of other women, right? So this idea that there was always a competition, um, you know, that people are kind of trying to take your partner, like this idea that you need to be standoffish against other women, I think is something that many of us have kind of been socialized into. Um, And you even see it you know I mean we just had a resurgence of mean girls right like the the musical just came out you know so so there is like this lore in pop culture around like women's relationships and that there will always be that mean girl kind of element um so I think it is important to think about if we really want to cultivate some sister circles and friendship circles with other women that that trust has to be there and that means we are going to have to work against some of the things that we have maybe been taught by our moms and grandmothers And the book really helps to kind of explore how those things kind of stick with us, even in ways that are not conscious to us, right? So let's say there's a new woman that starts in the office. Are you somebody who's automatically going to kind of welcome her and, you know, like, hey, let me give you the lay of the land and I'm here if you need any questions? Are you going to kind of keep her at an arm's length and kind of see like, okay, can I trust her? Is she here to take my spot? Like those kinds of things we don't always, we're not even always conscious of, but they do come up. And that also 
happens in our sister circles. And so if we really want to have our sister circles as a place where we can kind of lean on and um, give support and get support, then we do have to look at some of these unconscious things that often come up because of our childhoods. I don't know if I did a top five list of like the more, most important takeaways for people from all the psychology podcasts out there. You're, you're pointing to one of them, which is that the way that we show up as adults is often so hugely influenced by what's modeled to us when we're kids. And I, I think a lot of people think about, um, you know, like, oh, gosh, are we going back to childhood? But it's true. I mean, so much of so much of how uh, we, we do this one again. Yeah, totally. Totally. <laughs> Yeah, so much of how we interact is is based on how we were responded to as young people when we were kind of just learning about the world. So, yes, we are revisiting childhood yet again. <laughs> all, all roads lead back right there. But um, how do you help people like work through those kinds of issues, particularly around, um, you know, trust and feeling comfortable in those closer, more vulnerable relationships with other women? So I, I typically encourage people to start with small things and then see how it's received before you then open up with larger things to be trusted with. Right. And I think, you know, that's that's I think the case for people who have had an experience of maybe their trust being betrayed in the past, but also for people who have not had betrayals. Like, I think it's OK to kind of test out the water, so to speak, and get to know people and get to know whether they are trustworthy before you share larger things with them. Um, and so I, I think that that's a good thing to do. And I also think it's good for friend circles to have conversations about the kinds of things that you know about yourself that you need to work on, right? So if you are somebody who does tend to do a lot of people pleasing, or you're afraid to confront something about somebody, um, letting your friend circle know that I think can be helpful because they can then gently call you on that, like, hey, you're doing that thing again. Um, you know, and so I think that that's the part of why groups need to be cohesive is because when there is a cohesion, you can do things like that. You can call each other out with love in, in a way to try to, you know, increase the, the things that everybody's saying they want to work on. So let's say that you're somebody comes to you or you you get a, a note from a member of your community, your very, very large community. I'm sure you got to get a lot of uh, messages like this where they say, you know, Dr. Joy, I've just never thought of myself as being a, you know, quote unquote, girl's girl. I just, th that's not me. That's not my identity. I've, I've kind of struggled in these relationships in the past. Maybe I had some bad modeling, modeling for me when I was younger, whatever it is. But like these days, you know, I'm really looking around on my life and I want to strengthen those relationships. I want to get more comfortable and I want to work on that story, like the story I'm telling about myself as like not being a girl's girl. What do you think helps people start to, to work with those narratives in that way? Ooh, I love this question for us because I think that this is one of those things where a group would be beautiful to yeah. go to, right? So a women's <laughs> interpersonal process totally. group in totally. your area or online would be the perfect place to do some of this work. Um, but even if not there, I mean, we have a community in Therapy for Black Girls called the Sister Circle. That's not a therapy group, but it is meant to be kind of like a supportive space. It's meant to be a community where people can kind of continue the conversations from the podcast and work on some of these things that we're talking about about. And so if you're somebody who has had difficult relationships with women in the past, then putting yourself in a situation where you are interacting with other women and giving them the opportunity to respond to you differently than maybe women have in the past really is a great way for you to rewrite that story. So you are showing up differently and then you're seeing that other people are responding to you differently. And so I think for a lot of these things that are more interpersonal in nature, you can't do it just by kind of thinking through it or journaling through it like that. That may be a part of it, but you have to actually do this kind of in vivo, right? Like you yeah, gotta yeah. go out there and like put yourself in situations where you're having interactions with other people so that you can realize like, oh, okay, that was different than relationships with women I've had in the past. Let me try something else, right? And I think the key here is really to know that that doesn't mean that you won't be disappointed again in the future or that there might not be another betrayal of trust, but it is really to help you expand this idea that it's not an all or none kind of situation, mm. that there is some middle ground and some gray area that exists there as well. Yeah, to put my Rick hat on for a second, my dad, Dr. Rick Hansen, um, I think that one of the answers that he might give to this is that when things are different for you, experience them as being different. Like actually take a second to take a step back and go, oh, that turned out a little bit differently from the way that I was expecting. Like I think about myself a little bit here where if I have a story about the way that I am and things that happen that disconfirm that story, even like little ways, often I'll kind of downplay them. 
I'll be like, eh, you know, all right, it was different this time, but eh, am I really different? Nah, I'm not really different. I'm still the same old forest, but I'm having all of this evidence of being a different guy, but I'm not actually letting it land in like a meaningful way inside of myself. Yeah, that is a beautiful answer from perceived Dr. Rick, um, because that <laughs> is true, right? Um, you know, like we we do, we want to hold on to the stories that are most comfortable to us and the ones that we've held the longest, even when we're presented with new information. And so it is OK to kind of let things be new and to even be shocked and say, huh, let me think about this. Let me see if this happens again. Right. To allow for that element of surprise to, to really just kind of linger there and see if it continues. That's awesome. And one of the ways that these patterns can often show up for people, we talk about all the time in relationships and it's like attachment theory or attachment dynamics. But one of the places where I feel like we don't actually talk about attachment enough is in our friendships. And that's an important point that you make in the book as well, how our attachment patterns, which we think of as being mostly romantic, are actually just about relationships in general. Yeah, I mean, and I think for us, the reason is that like most of the research is done on like romantic relationships. Oh, no. um, and so, you know, wherever the research is, that's where kind of we we kind of tend to go. But if this is what shows up in our romantic relationships, it stands to reason that it would also show up in platonic relationships. And I also think that a part of what what is difficult about that conversation is that romantic relationships have had such like, put up on a pedestal kind of places in our lives. And a part of what I also wanted to do with the book is really give people the permission to reimagine this idea of where platonic relationships, especially with other women, kind of land in our lives. Because I think for a lot of women, if you think about like some of the biggest moments in your life, like it's girlfriends who are typically there with you, whether a romantic partner exists for you or not. And so being able to kind of carve out a space where we really can give um, some of this same shine, some of this same prestige to our platonic friendships, I think is really important. But to your, you know, your question, um, you know, the research around attachment is primarily with romantic relationships. And so that's why that's typically all we see. We've talked about attachment a number of times on the podcast in the past. So people will probably have like a good basic understanding of it. Um, but what are some of the common ways that you've seen an attachment style influence a friendship as opposed to like more of that classic romantic situation? Mm -hmm. I think in very similar ways. Right. And so, mm. you know, for people who just need a little bit of a refresher, the idea is that if you have had relationships with your parents or early caregivers where they were responsive to your needs, they kind of came when you cried, they made you feel seen and heard, then you likely develop a more secure attachment style. But if they were dismissive or kind of like left you alone or, you know, sometimes they came and sometimes they didn't, then you might develop a more insecure attachment style. And so when you grow up in relationships, both romantic and platonic, sometimes that looks like you may be being extra needy or extra clingy in relationships if you have a more insecure attachment style, right? And so we definitely know that happens with romantic relationships, but even with friendships, right? Like I often use the example of what happens when you like text a friend and then you don't hear back from them immediately. Are you thinking, oh, they're probably busy. They'll get back to me when they can. Or is your immediate thought like, oh my gosh, what did I do wrong? Are they mad at me? Right? Like that can mm. sometimes be an indication of attachment style stuff coming up in your friendship. Um, and so again, even though a lot of the research talks about romantic relationships, I do think that there are some extrapolations we can make to friendships. Now that we're here, and I love that we're talking about this, you dropped the in vivo earlier, so now I'm just like, here we are. Um, and uh, there, there's some really interesting research that suggests that people can have different kinds of attachment relationships with different figures or different situations, different groups of people. For a long time, we thought, you know, it was primary caregiver. That's where the attachment relationship exists. You have this one attachment relationship, and that just sets the tone for everything else. Turns out, if you look at your own experience, you can see. It's not really the case, right? Like I was probably pretty securely attached with my parents, had a pretty good relationship with them, which is great. But man, I was anxiously attached with other kids. I had all kinds of experiences growing up in uh, school ground situations and just, you know, things going a little bit sideways in those relationships that really made me feel unstable and insecure and, um, kind of cautious and worried about what would go on with other people with this real desire to connect with them, but often a lot of like fear and insecurity related to it. So if you're listening to this and going, oh, you know, I had this kind of a relationship with my parents. Why am I having these different sets of relationships in my friend groups or something like that? 
Well, that could be one reason why is that you can totally have those different kinds of paradigms in your life. Mm -hmm. I love that you share that for us because I think you're right. Like for a long time, we thought that attachment was also very fixed, right? So if you have one kind of attachment style, then like it was a lost cause, so to speak, right? Like if you're insecurely attached, you always will be. And I think what mm -hmm. research has shown us more recently is that through relationships with other people, we can have what we call corrective emotional experiences that then alter our attachments a little bit, right? So that's why working with a therapist can be great um, or even and, you know, again, securely attached friendships can really give us different ways of relating to other people that then change our our attachment style. One of the parts of the book that I thought was really fun, and maybe this is because everybody loves a, a personality test of one kind or another, is that you kind of laid out these different roles that people commonly play in groups. And also some of the like some of the personal difficulties that can come for people with being constantly placed or placing themselves into a certain kind of role inside of the group. Could you just like lay that out for a second here? Because I thought that was super cool. Yeah, I also love a good personality test because I think yeah. we love like learning like who we are and like what, what we kind of stand for. Um, so the, the four roles that I often see people finding in groups are the wallflower, the leader, the peacemaker, and the firecracker. Um, and so the leader is kind of what you would expect, right? Like this is the person that is probably most responsible for the friendship group continuing. So if y'all are getting together, it's very likely they sent the text that said, hey, let's meet up on Sunday. Um, so they're kind of, you know, the person who's most responsible for the group continuing. Um, the firecracker is the person who will kind of call the elephant in the room to the carpet, um, but maybe not always in the most graceful way. Um, and so if there is some kind of uh, tension in the group, it is likely that this person and kind of is at the at the core of that. Um, the wallflower is the person who is kind of, you know, kind of sitting on the sidelines, but when they do speak of, it's typically very deep and thoughtful and insightful information that they have to share. So people kind of stop and pay attention when they speak. Um, and then the fourth one is, which one did I forget? Uh, peacemaker. The peacemaker um, is the person who will, of course, try to keep the peace in the group, right? So if two friends are not talking, they're going to try to put you in a room together to say like, okay, let's try to hash this out. Um, and so, you know, all of those come with, of course, things that are helpful in a group, right? Like even the firecracker, which is the one that I think most people tend to think of as like a problematic kind of thing. Sometimes you need that kind of energy, right? Like you need people to be able to kind of say things that the group is not wanting to confront. Um, so they, they're all strengths, but they're also areas is that you be you may want to be careful with in the the circle. And so when I think about someone who may maybe assumes the leadership role, I think that that can often feel very daunting and you can become resentful very quickly if it feels like you're the only one who's interested in keeping the group going, right? And so it's important for people to know like who you are in the group and then how other people in the group can support you so that you can continue to keep the group moving. You're speaking to my personal history here a little bit, Dr. Joy, which I've talked about on the podcast <laughs> in the past. So you're really just like pulling right from that. We're basically like, I'm the classic coordinator type. I'm super socially mm. motivated. I really like hanging out with people. Um, and somewhere in there, it kind of just started feeling like if I wasn't the person who put it on the schedule, it was just never going to get on the schedule. And this was this sort of pattern was happening over and over in my my friendship relationships. And um, exactly like you were saying, I got to a place with it where I started to feel a little resentful about it. I started to be like, why, why is this always my job? Why, is it, why am I always the guy who's doing the work? Whatever it is. And then thankfully, um, in part because you know I do a podcast like this and I talk to really smart, insightful people, um, I was able to kind of take a step back from it and go like, okay, what's, what's actually going on here? Or to use some language from psychology, what are some of the secondary gains that I'm getting from this behavior? And the truth is, I got to control the environment. We went where I wanted to go. We did it when I was available to do it. And I was talking about that anxiety a little bit earlier. Wow, great tool to control your anxiety is to be the person who's like writing it all on the chalkboard, right? Um, so there was this funny thing that was happening where I was getting all these benefits while also being kind of resentful about the work that I was putting out because I wasn't really seeing it clearly. And then just being able to like get that space really helped with my resentment about it because it both let me lighten up and go, look, if you don't want to do the work, you don't have to do the work. While also mm -hmm. kind of seeing some of the advantages that were coming to me from being like put in that position by other people. So I don't know if that was a little excessively disclosing, but what do you think about that? 
<laughs> no, I appreciate you sharing that example. And I think you're you're not alone there, right? And I yeah, think we totally. have to think about this is why having difficult, sometimes awkward conversations in our friendship circles is really, really important because my guess is that what happened for you and what happens for a lot of our circles is that you just kind of get stuck in that role, right? And so it's not even the kind of thing where it's like, oh, I don't really care about this group, but if Forrest sends a text, I'll show up. It's kind of like, okay, we know Forrest <laughs> is going to do it, right? And so we then start looking to you to do that without any yeah. thought of, you know, is this putting an undue burden on him? Should I take up, you know, like you just don't know. And so it really is upon us. It's incumbent upon us when we find ourselves finding, feeling resentful or feeling some kind of way about something happening in the dynamic that we say like, hey, I just want to throw this out here and not in an accusatory, like y'all don't love me kind of, you know, nobody cares about this group of me. But hey, I'm noticing this thing. I wonder if we can talk about it or if we can share this responsibility or, you know, whatever it is. I think being able to say that then helps the group kind of think about like, oh, okay, well, let's pay attention to what the dynamic is and what ways it might need to shift. So you've already given one great answer to this, which is that kind of open communication where you you uh, you put the issues on the table in a more sort of visible way and in a way that doesn't feel like too loaded or intense, but it's real and you're kind of working on something together. And hey, that kind of shared support really helps build trust to get to back to what we were talking about at the very beginning, right? What are some mm -hmm. other ways that you've seen um, people step out of that role or work on assuming a different one if they feel like they're getting kind of just stuck in that pattern? Mm -hmm. I think very directly asking for support in whatever the thing sure. is, right? So if you're yeah. the leader and delegating or even asking like, hey, you know, George, can you coordinate our next get together or whatever um, is a very clear way of like asking for support as opposed to just kind of stewing with the resentment of like, I don't really want to be doing this. Um, so I think that that's another great way is just to kind of directly ask, can somebody else do this thing? So you had that example just right off the top of the dome when you said, okay, for somebody who's in that later role, that can be a common issue for them. And I immediately perked up and went, oh my God, this is my life. Are there other examples <laughs> of that for some of the other roles that just immediately spring to mind for you here that you feel like we should talk about? Yeah. So I think for the firecracker, um, you know, if you notice that you're the one who's always calling out the difficult thing that nobody else wants to talk about, I think that's also an opportunity for you to say, like, hey, is nobody else seeing this? Like, I, I feel... Um, you know, kind of burdened by this idea that I'm the only one who says these difficult things. And I think that that then gives the group an opportunity mm. to talk about how they want to have difficult conversations, right? So who is the person that is like not ever going to be okay with conflict and they're never going to say it? Or is there some different way that you could get at it, right? So a, a lot of times you will hear couples talk about like these um, state of the union meetings they will have where they'll have brunch on a Sunday morning and like go through this list of concerns and whatever, there's no reason why you couldn't do something like that in your friendship circle too, so that everybody then knows, okay, we're going to have things that we think we're doing really well, but we're also going to address things that we feel like we could be doing better. And then it is not on any one person to kind of call the elephant into the room. It is, you know, like, okay, we know we're going to do this at our next state of the union meeting or whatever. Um, so that could be an additional way to kind of get some of those things on the, on the table to discuss. Some people have a, a strong friend group where maybe they're the, the kinds of people who, who listen to therapy for black girls or listen to being well or do this kind of work or think about this kind of stuff. And some people don't, you know? And for, for friendship circles that have those kinds of close connections where these sorts of conversations are really on the table, like they're available, there can already be a feeling of security and safety and bringing forward that kind of an ask, like, hey, can we do this sort of a thing collectively? But for a lot of people, that can feel like really daunting and, and you know, kind of scary. Um, like they're the one person who's sort of going out on a limb with this ask for the group that they don't know how that's going to be received. And I'm wondering how you've seen people just get to a place where they feel comfortable making that move, whether it's an ask like you're describing for the friendship group as a whole, or maybe it's more in their, their individual relationships with people. 
So not to toot my own horn, but I do think that this is one of the ways that something like the book Sisterhood Heals or other books, right, um, or other resources can be helpful because I think it's the kind of thing where you can like all read the book together. And so, you know, it's really less about like you bringing this thing to the table. It's like, hey, look, this person wrote this book and they say it. These are the kinds of things that we could be trying in our relationships. And so I think that those kinds of things are really helpful. Like I've gotten lots of messages from people who listen to the podcast that use podcast episodes in that way, right? So maybe there's a conversation, like one of the ones this came up with a lot was our episode about um, difficult mother-daughter relationships. And so being able to kind of send this podcast episode to your mom or your grandmother and say, hey, you know, listen to this. Like, I think we should talk about it. Gives you an opening that, yeah. you know, like you yeah. just didn't have to create for yourself. Like you you can now talk about the content as opposed to um, any, you know, any kind of concern that you have with a person in particular. Um, so I think using resources like podcasts and the books and different conversation deck cards um, can be great ways to start some of these com- these conversations. Awesome. Yeah. I mean, you're describing a way to basically like Trojan horse it in, if that kind of makes sense, where rather than doing the big, vulnerable, emotional moment with the group of people, which, hey, if, if you're if you're up for that, fantastic. But if you're not up for that, being like, you know, sliding the book across the, the counter or whatever, be like, hey, by the way, I, I want to look at some stuff could be a great way in for people. That feels just a lot safer. Exactly, exactly. And I also think it's important for us for people to pay attention to, you know, if you find yourself in circles that don't want to have these kinds of conversations and you're somebody who really does, that it's okay to yeah. find other circles too. Um, not that you have to like leave this one circle behind, but it's also okay to kind of um, expand and find other places where you can kind of be fed in different ways. And it doesn't have to be a better than worse than kind of situation. It is okay for us to have different needs met by different people or different groups of people. So talking about needs, which has been something that I've really been focusing on a lot recently in like my personal content creation work, um, identifying, accepting, and then expressing those needs to other people, which is like the hardest stuff for people to do inside of their relationships. That is like incredibly vulnerable work. And I'm wondering what some of the major issues that you've seen are that are related to that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, this is so interesting to me for us because I think when you talk about it, like logically, if we're just having a conversation, like you're like, of course, everybody has needs, right? Like we are not robots. Yeah. We're flesh and bone. Um, You know, so of course we have needs, like we're human. Um, But for some reason, it is just very difficult, like you said, for people to be able to express those needs and to like follow up and say, hey, I actually really need the support. And I think what often has happened is that somewhere in our history, our our neediness has been weaponized against us or people have been kind of keeping track of like how much they gave to us. And so then they turn around and say like, okay, I did all these things for you. So now you have to do all these things for me. Right. And that's not exactly what reciprocity is in relationships. It's not like a scoreboard, like, okay, I did seven things for you. Now you got to do seven things for me. It's more a sense of like a give and take, right? Like we both show up where and how we can, and it just feels balanced. It's not as based on like, okay, a tit for tat kind of thing. What do you think helps people get more comfortable with that? Coming forward with that material, accepting it inside of themselves. I mean, there's so many cultural myths that we're carrying around around like rugged individualism and uh, needy is the worst word you can call somebody else. So we are really kind of fighting uphill here. Yeah. So far as there is, there was a piece I read that was so transformative to me. And of course, I'm not going to remember what the name of it was, but it was in the cut <laughs> It was in the cut and I feel like it was like a fiction piece about like a swan or something shedding feathers. I'll have to try to look it up and send it to you so that you can. I was about to say, I'm going to need the URL for this one. I'm going to look it up later. Okay. (laughs) But it it was basically it was some some kind of story that talks about like how we try to contort ourselves into all of these things that are not like authentic to who we actually are and in safe relationships right this is why sisterhood why friend circles why support circles are really important is because we can then experiment with being needy right and so again if you're somebody who struggles Mm -hmm. asking people to do things for you or asking for support in what small ways can you start 
practicing something differently, right? So I always use the example of like picking up somebody from the airport because it feels like that depending on where you live, this can be like quite a task, but it also could be a very easy way for you to just like ask for something just to get into the habit of doing it. Um, so thinking of different ways that you could kind of make small as just to get into the practice of asking. But I also think that as people who are in circles with other people, it's important for us to also know when our friends struggle with these kinds of things, right? So if you know you have a friend in your circle who struggles with asking for support, trying to do a little bit of anticipating their needs and like meeting it for them before they even have to ask, I think is a very loving act that makes it then maybe more likely that they will be able to ask you or someone else when they need things in the future. One of the questions that we get that is really kind of surprising to me in, in some ways, or it was surprising to me when we first started getting it, because I just didn't think that it was such a significant issue for people, is that we uh, we do all this talking about like, okay, we all got needs, and you can go through this process of meeting them, and that's really helpful when you can express them to other people. And they go, whoa, 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 slow down. I know that I have a need or a want, but man, I've got a really hard time looking inside of myself and figuring out what it is. And I'm wondering if that's something that you've also seen and how you kind of helped people through that. Yeah, you know, I, I agree with you. I definitely think that that comes up mm. for people because it's not always a conscious kind of thing, like the things that we Yeah, do it's kind of want. fuzzy, totally. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and so one thing that I think can be helpful for people to identify this thing is to like do a, a tally throughout your day or throughout a week where you feel frustrated, um, those times when you maybe feel lonely, like what are the, the areas in your life that come up where there's some kind of tension that is often an indication of a need. Um, so maybe it is, you know, feeling lonely or maybe it is that you need help proofreading papers or whatever it is, whether it's a tangible thing or something that's not as intangible. I think if we pay attention to our emotions and our feelings, this is where journaling and those kinds of things come up because it's an easier way for us to kind of track what happens for us in any given day. And then we can kind of pinpoint like, hey, that may be a need there for me and I can ask somebody or find some way to get some support around it. Yeah. So we've done a lot of generalizing throughout this conversation. We've we've used kind of broad, inclusive language. These are issues that come up for different people in different ways. I think that's really great. And also, the title of your podcast is Therapy for Black Girls. You work predominantly inside of that community. And I'm wondering if there are specific issues related particularly to needs and need expression that can come up for people who just have an intersectionality to their life that might you know, make it more uncomfortable to express a certain kind of need from somebody else. Oh, absolutely, Forrest. Absolutely. And yeah, thank you for totally. asking that question, um, because I definitely think having the experience of being a Black woman in this country and in likely very many other countries um, is one where you have likely been told that you need to kind of have it all together for yourself, right? So this idea that you would be leaning on other people or let other people know that you're struggling in some way is foreign to a lot of Black women. And so, so much of the work we do at Therapy for Black Girls and with the book is is really kind of helping people to realize like it really is okay for you to have needs and really relying on one another to help each other kind of take off that super superwoman cape that really requires us to kind of be all things to all people. And so I do think that for Black women in particular, this this issue of um, asking for your needs to be met and even identifying what needs you have is one that is even more salient. Thinking about my own experience, how hard it is for me to interact with these topics a lot of the time as a white guy, you know, who's had a lot of privilege in life. I've been set up in a lot of wonderful ways, you know, supportive family system, kind of the whole thing. Um, and even so, it's tough. So, you know, it's external to my experience, but I have to imagine it's even more fraud for people who are given an enormous amount of messaging about, you know, needing to show up a certain kind of way or just having their needs invalidated on a day to day basis, even if they're not really asking for that much. Yeah. And I think you really kind of hit on something there, the idea of having your needs invalidated, right? So this idea that you could even yeah. be brave enough and have enough, you know, wherewithal to kind of express a need and then somebody say like, oh, you don't really need that. or and, and we do it in passing sometimes without really thinking like, oh, you're strong. You'll figure it out, right? Or like you always have things together. And what we don't realize is that that is continuing this messaging that it's not okay for us to have needs, that it's not okay for us to share when we're struggling or could use some support. 
Sometimes in in therapy, what happens is there's this kind of like really beautiful inflection point where somebody goes from being very held around an issue to kind of cracking a little around it in a, in a really lovely way. And that vulnerability kind of comes forward. And one of the places where that's really happened for me is around this topic. And I'm wondering what you've seen support people in kind of getting to that moment where they can kind of claim that vulnerability while still being a strong person, which I think is like a really beautiful yes and in all of this. Um, is it just community support? Is it seeing it in other people? Or are there particular things that you think can be helpful? I think it's a combination of all of those things. But, you know, what I have seen most often happen in therapy where it has been most impactful is in the relationship between myself and a client, right? So there is, of course, and it's similar to what happens in group. This also happens in individual therapy is that it is not just about like techniques and strategies and like me telling you to go do a thing. It's about us me as your therapist and you as the client having an authentic relationship. And so there have definitely been times when people have come to me, even though they've wanted a Black woman therapist and that's who they really wanted to work with. There is something that happens in the dynamic as we are both Black women that requires, I think, sometimes you to even have a facade with me as the therapist, the person you are coming to looking for some support, right? So there is this idea of like, can I really fall apart? in front of her? Or is she going to think less of me because I'm struggling with all of these things? And so honestly, in our interactions with one another in the in the therapy space, that is able to unlock some things when they're able to say like, hey, I was really nervous about saying this to you, or I was worried about what you would think about me. Then we can have an honest conversation. And then again, that translates to the relationships they have with other women in their lives. So you've been at this for for a little while. We were referring to VCU in 2005. You've you've seen the field for a minute here. And I'm wondering how you've seen uh, the stigmas around therapy change over time. Yeah, you know, definitely. I feel like since I entered the field, there are just lots more general conversations about mental health now. I mean, you know, I definitely think social media has played a role in like really advancing some of those um, conversations. But I also think that there are so many celebrities that have also mm, shared their mm-hmm. own stories about mental health that that have really kind of opened up the space for us to say like, oh, these kinds of things don't discriminate, right? Like people that have all of this celebrity and resources and, you you know, fandom and all of these things, like we are all impacted by our mental health. We all have mental health we need to tend to. And so I've been really encouraged that so many people are sharing about their mental health journeys. So many people are, you know, seeking therapy and then sharing things that their therapist told them with other people. I mean, I just am fascinated and really um, excited about the energy that people have around mental health, because I do think there are still lots of people who are uncomfortable sharing certain kinds of things, or they think like, oh, I am the only one who deals with this. And so the more we do to kind of destigmatize it, the more people realize that they're not alone with whatever they're feeling. Just kind of thinking about it, maybe expanding it out a little bit here. Some people seem to think that just like everybody should go to therapy. Like I have friends who won't date a guy if he hasn't been to therapy. (laughs) Then there are, you know, some other communities where there's still a lot of stigma around it. And like therapy is only something that you go to if, uh, you know, to use some insensitive language, like if you're crazy, you know, Mm -hmm. and that's the only time where you should even think about it. And I'm wondering maybe like how people sort of think through this a little bit. Obviously, we're kind of preaching to the choir here if you're the kind of person who listens to a podcast like this. But still, like, just how do you think about that balance? Mm -hmm. I think therapy can be helpful for lots of different people in lots of different situations. Um, And one of the biggest misconceptions I think about therapy is that you only go when the house is on fire, so to speak, right? Like if we're at a code red, we know we got to seek out support. But I like to encourage people that you can do a lot of preventative, incredible like reflection and insightful work even if there's nothing really going on, so to speak. Um, And sometimes those are when you have the biggest breakthroughs, when you're not like actively trying to, you know, manage any crises, because then you're able to kind of just talk about like the day-to-day interactions and what do the patterns look like in your relationships? And so I think lots of people could benefit from working with a therapist, even if there's not like a crisis situation going on. As we get to the end here, uh, there's a chapter in your book that I particularly loved. And it was chapter three where you offer these, I think that the phrase you used was like guidelines for global sisterhood. And they're really just like beautiful ways of interacting with each other and seeing each other more as whole people. 
uh, I think there were four of them, if I'm remembering correctly. I think it was be one another's soft place to land, assume the best intentions, extend grace and compassion to one another and ourselves, and share your story so that others feel safe to share theirs. And kind of big picture here, Dr. Joy, if you could like take a step back, wave a magic wand, change one thing about how people interact with each other and maybe hold each other inside of those kinds of more friendship, supportive relationships that we've talked about today. I'm wondering what you would really focus on. Ooh, this is a huge question for us. This feels yeah. like a very, very big question. Oh, what would I think for one thing? I think if there were one thing, it would be to approach each other with more curiosity as opposed to judgment. Because I think that that is often what gets in the way of us being able to kind of create some of these more vulnerable spaces, spaces where people can feel safe, that we, when something happens, our immediate response is like, oh my gosh, what was she thinking? I would have never done that. As opposed to, hmm. I wonder what led to that decision for her, right? And I think when we approach things from a place of curiosity as opposed to judgment, it just allows for deeper conversations for us to kind of have our assumptions challenged and just makes for greater conversations and, and stronger relationships. I think you're totally right. And I think it's a fantastic thing to highlight. And if I go back through my own experience of friendships and relationships, like when did things go sideways for me? It was when I lost that curiosity, or maybe when somebody else lost that curiosity about me, but often it was me losing that curiosity and just like move into that place of um, being the one who knows, having knowing mind, as we sometimes kind of call it in Buddhism, as opposed to, you know, don't know mind. And uh, that just really gets in the way of so much that's available to us in our relationships, I think. Mm, beautifully stated. Thank you for that. This has been fantastic, Dr. Joy. I've loved this conversation. You are so Love great. It. You are such a pro. <laughs> and uh, as we as we get to the end here, I'm wondering, um, could you let people know where they can find you, where they can find the book, any other information that you want to share? Yeah, this has been such a pleasure for us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so you can find me all across the internet at Hello Dr. Joy on all of the social media channels. Um, my website is HelloDrJoy.com. You can find Sisterhood Heals book information related to that at SisterhoodHeals.com. And if you're interested in checking out the Therapy for Black Girls podcast or using the directory to find a therapist, you can find all of that at TherapyForBlackGirls.com. I had such an incredible time today talking with Dr. Joy. Uh, she's the host of the Therapy for Black Girls podcast and the author of the recently released book, Sisterhood Heals, The Transformative Power of Healing and Community. And we started the conversation by talking about group therapy, which we haven't really talked about very much on the podcast in the past. And I was just really grateful that we got to do it with Dr. Joy. And one of the things that she started with was the opportunity that's available for people in group that might not be available for them in individual therapy. And of course, individual therapy is great. It's what we mostly focus on, on when we talk about therapy on the podcast, uh, but it's just you and a clinician. So you are being seen by one person that you have a very specific kind of professional relationship with. But in a group setting, you are often surrounded by a group of peers, you know, five, six, seven people from different backgrounds that have something in common with what you're interested in learning about. You don't know how you're going to be seen by others. You're not paying them to empathize with you and relate to you in like the maximally perfect way, the way that you're paying a clinician to serve that role for you. And so there's more vulnerability that's kind of inherent in that process. And Dr. Joy talked about some of the steps that they go through to create a really safe and supportive container for people so they can come forward with the kind of vulnerability that's often necessary for us to heal in relationship with other people. If you have any kind of a relational wound, and I'm applying that phrase like incredibly broadly here, if you've had any kind of bad interactions with other people in the past, a painful history, issues inside your family of origin, whatever it is for you, right? then there's often this holding and protection around that wound where we don't come forward with it. We don't want to put it just on the table in front of other people. For starters, because that would you know, be a little unusual in our everyday interactions with them. And also because, hello, it's vulnerable. We don't want to get hurt in that same way again. But in order to heal around it, we often need to put it on the table in some kind of a meaningful way with other people. We need to risk the experiences that hurt us in the past 
and receive what's called a corrective emotional experience. In simple terms, we need things to go better today than they went in the past. But that is really hard for people. It's very vulnerable. It's very challenging. And that's what's kind of cool about group is that you learn that you can bring these issues onto the table and receive a different outcome these days with somebody other than your therapist. We then spent the next part of the conversation talking about how we can build that trust that allows us to be vulnerable in our friendships and in our communities of friends, our friend groups. And I was particularly interested in this inside of woman-to-woman relationships. Uh, the title of Dr. Joy's book is Sisterhood Heals. And what I've just experienced anecdotally, and you know, obviously I'm a guy, I'm on the outside of this, but just seeing my female friends inside of their relationships, words like trust and loyalty come up a lot more often, it seems to me, than they do in my relationships with other men. And this is also highlighted in the book where Dr. Joy talks about members of her community who sent her messages about how they received this story from their parents or from their mom about how like women can't actually be trusted. And so we talked a bit about how we can work with some of those patterns in adulthood. One of the big patterns that comes up for people, of course, is attachment relationships of different kinds. We talked about how that shows up in our friendships just in the same way that it shows up in romantic relationships. And Dr. Joy laid out these uh, four different friend characters that people tend to embody in their friend group. And they are the wallflower, the leader, the firecracker, and the peacemaker. And we talked about a couple of the specific issues. I was sharing my own experience as somebody who tends to do a lot of planning and coordination for groups, which I've talked about on the podcast in the past. Um, and she really kind of immediately got to the heart of one of the key issues that can show up for people who put themselves in that position, which is feeling a sense of resentment that nobody else is doing that work. We also talked about an issue that can come up if you're more of the firecracker in the group, where you're looking around going, wait, is, is nobody else seeing this the, this thing that's obviously a problem for us? Like, am I, is it just me over here, really? And I thought it was really interesting that over and over again, what Dr. Joy returned to were the ways in which we, we recover through relationship, through secure relationship with others, by bringing these issues out, putting them on the table, having frank conversations about them, even if we kind of Trojan horse those conversations by saying, hey, maybe I'm going to slide this book across the counter. Or, oh, have you listened to this recent episode of the Being Well podcast? I, I really think that, you know, you might get a little value out of it or whatever it is that you do. And of course, you don't want to be annoying about that kind of a thing, but it can sometimes be easier to refer to a third party in your friend groups than to really come forward as the person who is saying, hey, we should all sit down together someday and like work through the collective issues that we're having. It's hard for people to sign up for that, but they might sign up for listening to a podcast episode. We then closed with one of my absolute favorite topics, which is dealing with our wants and needs and particularly learning how to accept the fact that we have wants and then figure out what those wants are and then express them effectively to other people. And I'm really glad that we talked about how expressing those needs is particularly challenging for people if they're positioned in a place socially where their needs are commonly disregarded if they're part of a marginalized community, if they are not broadly supported by society at large, if they feel like they're put in a position where just asking for like the normal everyday stuff is hard enough to get, and you're telling me I can express these other more complicated needs? Like, come on, man, like nobody's gonna do that for me. If I feel like I need to be perfect all of the time, why would I ever show the more vulnerable underbelly of my experience? And so Dr. Joy talked about that common issue and some of the ways that people can start to work through it. And then I just really loved the point that Dr. Joy made at the very end of the podcast, where if she could kind of wave a wand and change one thing about most friendship relationships, she would advocate that we view each other with more curiosity and less judgment, that we come more from a place of being interested in why the other person's experience is the way that it is, even if it is a little different from our own. And I really think that that curiosity is a total superpower. And most of the times when I've gotten into trouble in my relationships, it's been because I lost that curiosity. Again, totally love this conversation with Dr. Joy. I think her work is completely fantastic. The book is Sisterhood Heals, The Transformative Power of Healing in Community. And at the end of the main body of the episode, she talked about some places where you can find her work if you're interested in learning more about it. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while and would like to support us, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwellpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple of dollars a month, you can support the show and get a bunch of bonuses in return. 
I'm also writing these days on Substack. It's a really cool blogging platform for creators. It's like the early 2000s all over again. And I'll include a link to that uh, if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening, I'll drop it into the podcast episode information. Also, finally, quick reminder at the end here, if you made it this far, please subscribe to the podcast. We really appreciate it. And also one of the best ways to support us is just by telling a friend about it. Until next time, thanks for listening and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.